You speak of Syria. I was going to ask you about highs and lows. I suspect that the low would be the Syrian conflict. If there's criticism about a lack of process now in the national security team, there is criticism of the Obama team for being perhaps too legalistic and too bureaucratic. Respond. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that um, it mattered greatly to President Obama whether we had an international legal basis to use military force. It mattered when we used drones against terrorist targets, and he, we developed an elaborate legal rationale. And it mattered when we were about to use force against the Assad regime. Uh, we came out and articulated what you might call an untraditional international legal basis, invoking the Chemical Weapons Convention and so forth. But the problem with law in the era of Vladimir Putin is that international law turns on being able to get Security Council authorization for the use of force, or for you to use force in self-defense, which is largely unobjectionable. And Vladimir Putin is himself trampling international law around the world and not likely to provide the United States with authorization to stop him or his proxies from doing so. So that's a structural tension that we ran into head on when we were prepared to use force initially after the chemical weapons use in August 2013. So I think that this is a major problem, a structural deformity in international law today that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, uh, maybe you could even say, others certainly would say Donald Trump are the arbiters of what's legal. That's an issue. And so I think it's fair to ask whether or not, you know, our administration's um, respect for adherence to faithfulness to uh, international law or attempt to be faithful to it is anachronistic in light of the rise of Putin and how international law gets defined. I think that what breaks my heart about Syria, in addition to just every day, any story you read about a Syrian family, um, is what I think the New York Times recently described as the Syrianization of the world, right? I mean, you know, you can't, we'll never know, but had we found a way, and I have no, you know, I had no silver bullet throughout, President Obama was always very eager to hear solutions that sounded credible and executable, um, and where the, it, it felt as though the, the, the benefits would outweigh the cost of the particular tool in, in play, and nothing we uh, argued about or, or lobbied for ever crossed that threshold for him beyond the things that you've seen us do. But, but what's crushing is to look and see how having now 66 million displaced people in the world, a third of whom are Syrian, um, how that affected the British decision making on Brexit. You know, how fear of refugees may even have been a factor in our election in a sense of two, two viewpoints, in the sense of the kind of horde of uncontrollable migration happening, not only, of course, from Syria, but also from North Africa and elsewhere. So I think it's hard to say that the Syria issue has not played a major role in the resurgence of terrorism and ISIL, uh, the heartbreak of millions of families, and, and more sort of psychic numbing around humanitarian suffering uh, than we had experienced you know, in many, I think, generations. I mean, Rwanda was the last kind of calamity of this magnitude, but it was over in 100 days. We're all so used to seeing barrel bombs and chemical weapons use and refugee flow. And that dulls the senses and our expectations for how we treat one another and how we act as a, as a great nation. So I think the costs are gonna be felt for a long time to come. That doesn't therefore follow, as some would, would argue, that you know, had we just followed Samantha's three-point plan or John McCain's three-point plan, you know, that we'd be in a different place. We could be in exactly the same place, but bogged down with ground troops and God knows what else. Uh, but it's, it's hard to imagine a worse set of consequences than where we are today.